Nesse primeiro bloco de notas de 2020, nós estreamos em parceria com a Escola de Verão em Química da UFSCar, que chega à sua 40ª edição, uma série de entrevistas com os convidados internacionais do evento, que são referências em suas áreas de atuação. Nossa primeira convidada é a professora Christy Haynes, da University of Minnesota, nos Estados Unidos. Professor, thank you very much for your time. Talking to you, it's a great opportunity to me and to our public. Thank you, Mariana, that's very nice. You are, since last year, a distinguished McKnight professor at the University of Minnesota for pushing the limits of analytical chemistry. Uh, I don't think our public is familiar or totally familiar with the idea what is analytical chemistry, so I would like you to start explaining us how does it work, what the, the main questions are, and also what limits have been pushed lately. Hmm. This is an excellent question. I think usually when people think about chemistry, they think about organic chemistry or inorganic chemistry, right? Where you make molecules or new materials. Analytical chemistry is really important for all of the other subfields of chemistry because the point is to develop new measurement methods. So if you can't measure it, how do you know if you have it? So my goal in analytical chemistry is, like you said, to push the limits. And mainly, mainly what that means is, How can we detect smaller numbers of molecules? How can we detect molecules or atoms that are important? And so one aspect would be maybe developing a new sensor, right? So maybe there's a, a disease and you find what the biomarker is and you want to know if you can detect it in somebody's blood. Analytical chemists would be the people that would develop a new method to measure that. Uh, but sometimes we're also just developing tools for other chemists to use. So maybe somebody's made a, a new composition of battery material, but they have no good way to characterize it. Analytical chemists are the ones that figure out what new tools or what new methods will let you do that. So analytical comes really from analysis, from understanding the, the matter. Yeah. yeah. And you work in the interface of bioanalytical and biomaterials chemistry. What does it mean? What is this interface and uh, what problems it can help us to solve? Yeah, so I'm really interested in bioanalytical problems because the human body or the ecosystem are really important systems for us to study, right? And they're really complex. If you think about your body and all of the molecules and chemicals that are there, it's really complex. If you think about the ecosystem, it's really complex. And so if you, if you want to do measurements in important systems, you need to work in those. And in terms of materials, I mean, I'm really interested in, like I mentioned, sensors, new sensors. I'm really interested in new technology. All of that is in new materials that chemists develop. And so for me, the interface of those things, how do we make new materials that will serve new purposes? Or when we make new materials that serve new purposes, How will they interact with the ecosystem? Those are really important questions, and you need an analytical chemist that can both understand the materials and what's happening to them and develop new methods to measure. So we sit right at the interface of, of those things. So enabling technology, whether it's for kind of sustainability or for human health, th that's what drives me to be at that interface. And uh, you've been working in a kind of new field, in an emerging field, which is nanotoxicology. We hear a lot about uh, the wonders of nanoscience and nano nanotechnology, but not as frequently about its problems. Mm -hmm. Which problems are these and uh, how does nanotoxicology uh, frames these problems or tries to, to solve or to understand these problems? This is a really important question. I completely agree that nanotechnology has lots of really positive upsides. I think we will have new medicines, we will have new batteries, we will have new agricultural products because of nanoscience. And so I think the potential is huge, uh, which is why I think we should pursue it. But I think um, 
as scientists, we have a responsibility to be proactive about understanding what the unintended consequences of those nanomaterials might be. So that is why the field of nanotoxicology emerged, because scientists were making more and more nanomaterials, which is great, because we have new applications of them. We wouldn't have the electric vehicles we have if we didn't have nanomaterials, for example. So those are really important. But we also need to think of at the end of life, right, when you're done with your electric car, what happens to the nanomaterials that are part of it? And so this is why nanotoxicology emerged, is so that people could think, is there anything different about nanomaterials from a toxicological impact? And the truth is, nanomaterials are important because they have different chemical and physical properties than when you make, it in, make the material in bulk or when you just have atoms. And so if you have new chemical and physical properties, you might have no, new modes of toxicity. What I'll say, is that to date, nobody has found a mode of toxicity for nanoparticles that is different than you would find for molecules. So there's no you know, big red flag that says stop. In fact, there's lots of evidence that as long as we understand how nanomaterials change once they get into your body or into the ecosystem, we can actually predict the toxicity pretty well from what we know about ions and molecules and atoms already. So it, the field of nanotoxicology is really interesting. It started out as something where people were a little bit scared, right? They were thinking, oh, maybe nanoparticles are bad, maybe we don't want them. And really in the last couple of years it's shifted to say, actually we can understand these pretty well and maybe we can even imagine some new applications that are even better than we originally thought. So the field has really shifted to a proactive understanding sustainability promoting kind of direction, which I'm really excited about because I think it means chemistry can do some good, nanoscience can do some good for people. And uh, is there already a community of people studying nanotoxicology? How mature is the field yeah. today? It, there are. I would say the field is roughly 15 years old and when it started there were not very many chemists in it at all. It was mostly toxicologists, right? People who were used to studying toxicity of carcinogens or you know pollution. Uh, and actually it started with inhalation toxicology. People were worried about the particles that, that people are breathing just from combustion engines, right? So these are not purposefully made nanoparticles. This is just what an engine makes when we run it. Uh, so all of the people that knew about inhalation toxicology started thinking about nanoparticles a little bit, but they weren't chemists, so they weren't making nanoparticles, they weren't really characterizing them super carefully. And then you had some people that made beautiful nanomaterials that really thought, oh, we should think about potential toxicology, but they didn't actually know about toxicology. So they were taking these um, assays, these experiments that toxicologists did, but they didn't actually know how to do them very well. So there was this big disconnect, and then just in the last couple years, the fields have really started to merge. And so now they're talking to each other, and chemists have gotten involved kind of in the middle. People are being trained in the area. So the, the community has grown, and it's actually a really, it, it's a really good community. It's a lot of people trying to figure out how to share information, which isn't always true, right? Sometimes scientists keep their information to themselves because they want credit. This field tends to be one where everybody's trying to figure out how do we put all the information together so that we can draw some bigger conclusions and has even been talking to policymakers and regulators, which again, scientists don't always do that. So I would say it's a, I mean, it's a really interesting community to be a part of, really multidisciplinary, which I love personally. I can notice it. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, one of your partnerships, the, one of uh, the, 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 the places where your research group interacts is the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology. I would like you now to present as the center, its main goals, oh. and what's necessary to have a sustainable nanotechnology and a sustainable nanoparticles, for example. Yeah, um, so I'm really lucky. I work with, I have, let's think, 15 other faculty across 12 other institutions in the US and we applied for this grant and it's actually the largest grant that the chemistry directorate of the US National Science Foundation gives and it's to fund this center. So we wrote a proposal saying we wanted to understand the molecular mechanisms of how nanoparticles interact with biomolecules so that we could control toxicity essentially, right? And um, the center so far, we've had eight years working together, 
and working together isn't easy. We're across the entire US, which is about the same size as Brazil. So imagine having 15 faculty spread all over Brazil. Um, and our students, there are about 70 students that work within the center across all those groups. And so our students all have to work together. And we have a ton of teleconferences, but all of our students actually do lab exchanges. So my students travel to California and they travel to Baltimore and they learn how each lab's experiments work. But overall, the goal of the center is to understand at a molecular level, at a chemistry level, how nanoparticles interact with biological molecules or membranes or cells. And then when we figure out um, kind of how nanoparticles might be negatively affecting the biological system, we want to use chemistry to redesign the nanoparticle to avoid that. So we're working hard both on minimizing those unintended consequences and designing whole new nanoparticles that might have really interesting sustainable applications. So a good example that we're working on right now, my group is making some silica particles. So that's the same as sand and glass, right? That's silica. But we're making really small bits of silica and we're designing the chemistry so that they dissolve in a controllable fashion. And when silica dissolves, it releases a molecule called silicic acid. And in fact, silicic acid is what plants use to build their cell walls. So one of the collaborators in the center has greenhouses. He's an analytical chemist, but he's a, he studies plants. And so we're adding these nanoparticles to plants, plants are taking them up, the particles slowly dissolve, they release silicic acid, the plant cell walls get stronger, and so now they aren't gonna get a disease that compromises the crop. So we haven't added a pesticide, which not everybody likes adding pesticides, right? We've essentially bulked up the plant's kind of basic micronutrient system so that it can protect itself. And so that's an example where we're actively going after you know, issues we're gonna have with global food supply. How do we increase crop yield using nanomaterials? So that's a long, <laughs> that's a long explanation to your question, but it's a giant group of people, mostly chemists, a couple not chemists, some experimentalists, some people doing theoretical and computational work because that's how you cover a much larger space of materials and biological systems, right, is by doing some computational work. Uh, but working really closely together, even though we're technically far apart, to try and really maximize the impact of nanotechnology. And together with your research work, you also have or take part in some outreach activities. Mm -hmm. So why is it important to talk about science to the general public, to children or very young people, for example, yeah. and especially nowadays? I started doing outreach work because there are not so many women in chemistry, and I was really interested in why that was the case. And so I was interested, because I'm a woman in chemistry, I thought maybe if I show up and I tell them why I'm excited about chemistry and I look like I'm having fun, maybe we can start to change that. Um, my lens on that has really expanded. I'm, I'm really interested in who is not participating in science. Um, in the US, it's, there are not very many people of color that do science. There are not very many first generation students. There aren't very many immigrants. There still aren't that many women that do chemistry. And so my question is, why? Is it because we haven't been talking to them? Have we not conveyed why we need more ideas from a broader set of people to get better scientific outcomes? And so that, that is really the driving force for me to do outreach. I also feel like it's kind of my responsibility. I mean, I am lucky enough to have the job I do. I work at a public institution, which means um, technically I serve the state of Minnesota and you know the US government. And so I feel like I also have a certain responsibility, not just to keep what I know to myself, but to, but to talk to a broader audience. And my graduate students, my undergraduates, my postdocs, I think they need to learn how to do that um, in part so that we have a knowledgeable public that will vote to support funding for science, and in part so that we get a bigger set of people that are participating. And now, how have you first met science, and when and how you've decided to be a scientist? Yeah, so I am not the typical story, right? What you usually hear is, oh, I always knew I, I wanted to be a scientist. When I was a, when I was a kid, kid, I <laughs> took apart my alarm clock and I put it back together. Uh, that, that was not me. So I'm, uh, neither of my parents went to college. I'm a first generation college student. Um, I don't think there are any scientists in my family before me, actually. Mostly teachers and accountants. Um, and I did not really 
I didn't really know what a college professor's life would be, right? I mean, I, I didn't know any of that stuff. Um, but I had a really great high school teacher who said, hey, you're good at chemistry. And I just wanted, you know, somebody to, an adult to say, oh, you're good at something. <laughs> um, that's a typical story, you know. Not, yeah. not, not, not very frequent, but right. uh, it's common that we hear that teachers were so important well, in the life of students. It was yeah. a little rockier yeah. than that, though, because my first day of chemistry class in secondary school, um, my teacher did a demonstration, right? Chemistry professors often do these chemical mm -hmm. demonstrations. And he took a big balloon, and it was filled with hydrogen and oxygen, and he you know, lit it with a lighter, and it was this giant flame. And I was actually really scared of fire. Mm -hmm. I had, actually, I lived in a house that caught on fire once when I was uh -huh. a kid, so I was a it's real pyrophobe. And I was sitting in the front row because I was like the teacher's pet kind of kid who sat in the front row. And I left that classroom the first day and thought, no way, I do not want to go back. Um, but this teacher was really great. And um, on the second day of class, he showed us a video where it was all about careers in chemistry. And I remember there was one little piece of the video where there was there was a woman scientist and she was wearing like a hazmat suit and she was taking samples of some toxic waste dump and it said this chemist is taking samples she's going to go back to the lab and figure out how how she can remediate how she can take care of this toxic waste and I for me there was this moment where I was like oh this is something where you can really do good. You can do something really kind of positive and powerful. And because lots of people are scared of chemistry, and they are, um, if you're good enough at it and you want to do something good, that, that's a pretty great combination. So I'm, right, so I am not the kid who always knew I wanted to be a scientist. If you had get, asked me when I was 10 or 11 or 12, I probably would have said that I wanted to be, I don't know, a linguist or, I mean, I really like languages. I like math, but I never would have guessed chemist. But it's, it's served me really well. There's lots of opportunities. There's lots of flexibility, right? You can be creative, but also really technical. And I get to work with students my whole life. So being surrounded by people that are in that moment where they're discovering things about themselves, and it, it's, it's really great. Yeah, you seem to have a lot of fun in it. I too. do. I have a lot of fun. And then you get to do amazing things like this, right? I get invitations to come to Brazil for the first time. And, I mean, that's an adventure that I'm enjoying. But also to meet all the students here and to maybe make new collaborations. I mean, who doesn't want friends all over the world, right? That's a pretty, that's a pretty great part of this job, too. So chemistry is really enabling for that. It's been... Yeah, it's been a really good career choice for me. I think a lot more people should probably choose it. <laughs> okay, Chris, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much for talking to me and for being here in Brazil. Thank you. Obrigado. De nada. Esse foi mais um bloco de notas e para quem se interessou pelo trabalho da professora Christy, pode visitar o site do seu grupo de pesquisa. A gente se vê no próximo bloco de notas. Thank you.